And it's been six months of Russia-Ukraine war. It's been over six months since Russia invaded Ukraine in what Moscow calls its special military operation. Thousands have been killed. Millions have may been made homeless. And the world has seen the worst East-West tensions since the Cold War. Global financial markets have been in a tailspin. After that, though they have recovered a bit, but nothing about the future is certain now. While in U.S. recession fears are looming large, President of Federal Reserve Bank on Minneapolis, Neil Kashkari, he said his biggest fear is inflation will be more persistent now. U.S. new home, home sales have tumbled to six-and-a-half-year low. Meanwhile, among this all gloom and gloom, global economy India is emerging as an area of hope. And today, to talk all that and much more, we are joined by Mr. Ilyas Pivak. He is head of Greater Asia at DailyFX.com. Good morning to you and I'm sure good night over there. Before we speak about a lot of things, let's begin with Russia-Ukraine war. How do you see over how, what has happened over the last six months? What is your assessment going forward? Where will this all stop? I mean the falling of the market or the volatility we are seeing now. Good morning. Uh, I think one of the main considerations at this point are, of course, the knock-on effects that this is having uh, when we look at the situation from the financial markets perspective on energy uh, and certainly on financial stability in Europe. Uh, one of the uh, main takeaways, of course, here is the surge in the price of natural gas that is contributing to inflation uh, that is uh, quite significant at this point uh, in the eurozone. And that, of course, beckons the ECB to act. And uh, they've had some issues actually moving in that direction because of divergence in local bond yields and the specter of another debt crisis if the ECB were to move too quickly. They're trying to address that, but uh, it's still unclear exactly how they're going to do it in practical terms. So, of course, this remains a concern and a stability risk. Uh, as far as the situation itself, I think uh, some sort of a negotiated resolution is likely to eventually occur. Um, but of course, it is being somewhat uh, dragged out because Russia has been able to remain uh, an exporter of energy, at least to some extent. That has um, allowed it to make a significant uh, risk premium on uh, the price of its exports because of all the lockdowns uh, and the sanctions. And so I think perhaps the path w is a bit more elongated yet. But I do expect that some sort of a partial negotiated settlement eventually arrives. The question is, of course, when? Uh, Mr. Spivak, crude is clearly in focus. It's disturbing the mathematics of global economists and other analysts as well. What, according to you, is going to be the future of crude now? Because a lot has happened. Uh, a while ago, OPEC Plus decided for some output raising, but it is not up to the expectations. What, in your opinion, is the crude price's future? One of the very interesting contrasts, we were just talking about the surge in natural gas uh, in the energy space is, is, of course, crude oil, because uh, there the price has come down significantly from the highs that were hit uh, when the crisis in Ukraine initially hit the headlines. Uh, I think here the story is increasingly becoming about demand. Uh, we're looking at global growth that is slowing uh, in no small part because of significant monetary tightening by the uh, developed world central banks, um, the G10 central banks for the most part. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is now quickly becoming seemingly a story more about demand than it is about supply. As we see global growth expectations come down, uh, so too crude oil has declined. Uh, for OPEC and uh, their allies part, they've been saying that they will increase supply uh, and they have not delivered on uh, those um, those efforts as yet they've uh, increased the target output but they haven't actually met it uh, and now that the demand side is coming uh, closer into focus there is all of a sudden jitters that they might actually ponder a cut that of course uh, is also to some extent optics because they haven't delivered on the hikes that they've suggested for quite some months now. So it's unclear that this is a major consideration near term.
And also, you are there in US. Recession fears are always, uh, we have been talking about over the last few months now. In the we last few weeks, they have become stronger. What is your assessment in about the US recession? Is it really something which is unavoidable at this moment? I don't think it's unavoidable. But of course, when we use uh, language uh, like recession, um, I think the, the significance of calling it that or, or not calling it that um, is... Uh, somewhat superseded uh, in the minds of, uh, of investors than the reality on the ground. Uh, we, of course, have not had the, um, the definition uh, cemented here by the National Bureau of Economic Research. They would formally declare a recession. Sometimes that means two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Sometimes it means less. Sometimes it means more. So uh, we're going to find out if that label is going to get attached, but it is certainly not debatable. And we saw this in the PMI numbers out of the U.S. earlier today. There's a meaningful slowdown in economic growth. I think uh, weak conditions are likely to uh, persist here for some time because the bank shows no signs of wanting to back down from uh, its tightening cycle, and it will be sometime yet, perhaps, when they can really declare victory and say inflation has been tamed, we can let up. I think uh, in between then and now, the growth story in the U.S. will be weak, whether we call it recession. We on now available in your country. Download the app and get all the news on the move.